Hello, Mount Sinai and everybody listening in. Let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, we come now to study your word, asking as always that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive you afresh. Father, we thank you in advance. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are still studying the articles of faith and we have made our way down to article number 11, the perseverance of saints. Our author writes, we believe that such only are real believers as endure until the end, that their persevering attachment to Christ is the grand mark which distinguishes them from superficial professors that a special providence watches over their welfare and that they are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. Our main scripture continues to be John the 8th chapter verses 31 and 32, which reads, To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Our focus continues to be on the latter part of verse 32, and the truth will set you free. And so we've been looking at truth that will set us free. And we said that it won't just happen, that there are conditions, which is why Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And one such truth, is that we have freedom from defeat and that we have no obligation to the flesh. Uh, and that's found in Romans the 8th chapter, verses 5 through 17, which is our second declaration of faith. Again, today I only read verses 5 and 6, which says, Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. And we are looking at defeat as a mindset. We said that if my mind tells me that I'm defeated, then I'm defeated. I, I can't be free if my mind tells me I'm defeated. But... If I change the message that, I, that I'm sending to my mind, then things will change. And we've been looking at the disciples, uh, Peter in particular, how his mindset went from being on top of the world to that of being defeated. And how he spent two days after the crucifixion in shock and despair and afraid and, and cast down. Uh, he was dealing with shame and dealing with guilt and regrets. And can you imagine Peter living with the shame of denying Jesus after boldly and loudly declaring that he would rather die with Jesus before he would deny him? Last time we left off, uh, we left off with Mark's account of the resurrection. Mark, the 16th chapter, verse 6 through 13, and it reads, but he, the angel, said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. And go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him as he said to you. So they quickly, they went out quickly and fled from the tomb. For they trembled with amaze and were amazed, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Then I said, an amazing thing happened. Uh, verse 9, when Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him and who were mourning and weeping, when they heard that Jesus was alive and that she had seen him, they did not believe it. The amazing thing to me is that they did not believe it. You would think that her telling them of his resurrection would jar their memory. That, that 
it would at least open the possibility that just maybe it was true. But the truth is that it, it, it's, when you think about it, it's only amazing to me because I know the story. But if you put yourself back in time on that Sunday morning, then you would, you know, you would still be grieving. Uh, you would still be in disbelief. You would still be wishing that things had been different. In real time, think about it. If I had gone to the funeral, I had viewed the body, had gone to the graveyard, of course, you know, we have repasses. They, they probably wouldn't have had a repass because, number one, they were too afraid that the same thing that had happened to Jesus would happen to them. But think about it. After you had gone to the funeral, after you had gone to the graveyard, uh, after you've seen him crucified, then three days later, somebody came and told you that they had seen that person that you saw buried. The likelihood uh, of me or you believing them is probably slim to none. I would think that they are in so much grief that, you know, I, I would think that that person was in so much grief that they're seeing things. And to put it bluntly, I would think that they just lost their mind. Uh, it, it, it wouldn't have mattered that he told me that he would get up. I mean... It, it, none of that would have mattered once I went to the funeral, once I went to the graveyard. I would be dealing with facts. And the fact is that I saw him dead. The fact is that he was in the grave. So therefore, in my mind, it's all over. So like us, the disciples didn't believe the women when they came and told them. And so then verse 12 and 13 says, after that, he appeared, he being Jesus, appeared in another form to two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Now, at this point, putting myself back in time, I would probably be thinking, have everybody lost their mind? This thing is getting weird. And then finally, in verse 14, it says, Later, Jesus appeared to the eleven as they were eating. He rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. Now, at this point, if you have read the different accounts of, of Jesus' appearances, you know that it's kind of hard to put everything in exact order. It's, it's hard to say this happened, then that happened, then this happened. Uh, but we are told that he appeared to Mary Magdalene first, then to the women running to tell the disciples of the empty tomb. Then it seems that he appeared to Simon Peter. We know this because in Luke, the 24th chapter, after the two men on the mayor's road ran back to tell the disciples that he was alive, Luke chapter 24, verse 33 says, they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the 11 and those with them assembled together and saying, it's true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. So at this time, doing all of this running and telling of his resurrection, Jesus appeared to Simon. We're not told the details of his appearance. Uh, we're not told when it happened or the details, but one can only imagine after all the emotional lows that Peter had experienced from Friday to Sunday, then for Jesus, to appear to him and restore him and forgive him. I would have loved to be there. I, I mean, I can get excited just thinking about it. When I think about such occasions in my own life, when I have denied Christ, when I have disobeyed him, when I have gone left and he told me to go right, when I wouldn't go 
or when I wouldn't do when he's asked me to. And, and then the, the, the guilt sets in. And, and then the nights are long and the days are dreary. Then like the summers, I enter into my sanctuary, my own private sanctuary, and confess my sins and ask the Lord to restore the joy that comes with salvation. And he does. I can only imagine the joy that Peter felt when the Lord made a special visit and restored him. Remember, Jesus told Peter in Luke, the 22nd chapter, verse 31, he said, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Peter had been sifted, which is a lesson we had in the past. He had failed. He had fallen under Satan's attack. But Jesus had prayed for him that his faith may not fail. Jesus prayed that Peter's faith would not permanently fail that his faith would not totally fail and that Peter would not absolutely be, would not be absolutely ruined. He had prayed so that Peter would not absolutely and totally deny Christ. Yes, he did stumble and yes, he did fall, but Jesus had prayed that he would not remain down, that he would not stay in sin, and desert Jesus forever. Hebrews 7 and 25 tells us that he is able to save to the uttermost, which means he saves completely and forever. In my mind, I think that Jesus made a special appearance to Peter because Peter had some special work to do. Jesus' prayer for Peter was that once he had turned back, he was to strengthen the brethren. Peter couldn't strengthen them until he had first been strengthened. Broken people can't strengthen each other. The only thing that broken people can do is compare sorry stories. And, and so Simon Peter had been restored. His faith was still intact. And now it was time for him to strengthen the brothers. In Luke 24 and 34, when Peter told them that he had seen Jesus, they said, it is true. The Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then verse 36 says, now as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed they had seen a spirit. You just got to love the disciples. They are so much like us. It's like looking in the mirror. Uh, I just love them because it lets me know that, that there's hope for me. <laughs> they have gone from being excited because they heard the testimony of Peter to being terrified and frightened when Jesus stood in the midst of them and, and thinking that they had seen a spirit. Or in our words, they thought they saw a ghost. Now y'all, I get that. Remember, we have put ourselves back on that Sunday. By, by now, it's mid-morning, mid-afternoon, or possibly evening. And, and, and all day, we've been hearing rumors. And, and now, Peter has convinced us that Jesus is alive. But then, he just appeared. Even though he says, peace to you, peace is not my first emotion. Terrified and frightened would sum it up. Jesus had, had worked some miracles. He, he had some work to do on them. Their, their emotions were all over the place. Think about it. They had seen Jesus do a lot of amazing miracles, but he had never just appeared in a room without walking through a door. And verse 38 says, he said to them, why are you troubled? 
And why do you doubt? Why do doubt arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me. See for, handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. But while they still did not believe for joy and marveled, he said to them, have you any food here? So they gave him a piece of raw fish and some honeycomb, and he took it and ate in their presence. Can you imagine the look on their faces? Also, I can also imagine the calming effect of him eating in their presence had on him. It's just something about food and eating that can calm you down. Verse 44 says, Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scripture. Verse 46, then he said to them, thus is it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. And ver finally, verse 50, well, verse 50, and he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Now it came to pass while he blessed them that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, verse 53, and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. There's still more. But you got to come back next week because that's this is not where the story ends. There's lots more. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that you are so amazing. We thank you for the disciples who look so much like us. We thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you for preserving it all these years. And we thank you for your Holy Spirit that gives us understanding. In Jesus' name, amen.